I suppose uh, by now everybody has been introduced. My uh, introduction to him, of course, was yesterday uh, with uh, his very insightful conversation on cinema and television. And uh, uh, he is a doctoral candidate at the School of International Studies, JNU. New Delhi and an independent filmmaker, Monologue, which is a uh, most recent film. He will be speaking on, uh, if I am reading it right, Ami Hibbek Sojun Kani that is, we will do anything else but break, break on Marathi stage during the Cold War from culture to conjecture. Back. So I'll uh, begin uh, with this uh, Marathi quotation uh, which is there in the title. Ami uh, sodun kahi karu. We'll do anything else but brecht. Dr. Mohan Agashe uh, said this uh, in an interview while recounting Theatre Academy, uh, a group started in early 70s in Pune and which became nationally and internationally renowned theatre group. And uh, Dr. Mohan Agashe uh, has been one of the founder members and uh, leading actors and more like an actor manager working in that group. So while he was negotiating with Max Muller Bhavan about the priorities of theatre academy while taking funds, grants, or entering into collaborative cooperation with Maximur Bhavan, he said, we'll do anything else but brush. So, uh, I find this uh, statement quite striking because uh, it's not only uh, Dr. Agashe, but I find uh, this response to brush shared across the board uh, I've been interviewing several people uh, who are working in theatre or uh, were contemporaneous to the developments in Marathi theatre in the late 60s, 70s and 80s. And across the board you find this uh, peculiar response which, if I were to use a term used by Vijaya Mehta. So Vijaya Mehta, a renowned theatre director from Mumbai who collaborated with Fritz Benemitz a theatre director from erstwhile German Democratic Republic uh, who had come to India as a part of intergovernmental cooperation in the late 60s and collaborated with Vijaya Mehta and uh, did a Marathi version of Caucasian Chalk Circle uh, written by C.T. Khanulkar called Ajab Nyay Vartuyasa and she premiered that play in Zurich, the first international premiere and in a certain sense, the first modern Indian theatre was going uh, abroad for the very first time during the Cold War. And uh, the audience after the play came and she reports that uh, the audience said that, Oh, thank God, you cured us of our breast weariness. So there's a certain fatigue, a certain exhaustion with breast, which she articulates it. And interestingly, uh, later when she goes and uh, starts uh, performing in the German Democratic Republic uh, in Weimar, uh, Benevitz was a theatre director at the Weimar, National Theatre of Weimar. After the first performance, again the audience comes and says, Oh, you've given us back what we have lost in our Brecht. So there is a feeling that there is something missing with Brecht there. And a third interesting response I find, and uh, which is repeatedly articulated by a renowned public intellectual, scenologist, playwright, and thinker, uh, late G.P. Deshpande, uh, who was also a professor in the School of International Studies here in JNU. So in two of his books, one, Dialectics of Defeats, and uh, another one, where doing uh, pol uh, <coughs> politics culturally, where he says that 
after looking at this breast season in India, uh, which is roughly between 1965 to early 80s, this plethora of breast productions in New Delhi, in Maharashtra, in Bengal, in southern India, wherever you go, you find breast as a part of intergovernmental cooperation or whatnot. While looking at it, he says that, see, we've almost turned breast into an Indian playwright. He represents certain aspirations uh, which are cultural nationalist aspirations. Because with breast, we want to go back to our roots, to, to be authentically Indian. And uh, all of that sickens him at one level. And he says, after looking at this, I think what we need is anti-breast. Like <coughs> Engels said, anti-during, we need anti-breast. And I think I would like to uh, read all these responses together uh, into uh, a framing I call conjunctural framing. And uh, before I come to conjuncture, I would briefly like to talk about uh, one of the dominant framings in which Brecht and India relation has been uh, thought about or imagined, particularly uh, the scholarship around the collaboration of Fritz Benevitz and Vijay Mehta. This relationship uh, has been thought about as an intercultural collaboration. And here the term intercultural is used in a disciplinary sense, where a sub-discipline of theatre studies, uh, intercultural theatre, which emerged in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, and it primarily goes through two revisions. One, uh, supposedly uh, Eurocentric liberal version, which is more tending towards a certain multiculturality. And after taking in a round of post-colonial critique of that liberal multiculturality, it tends to uh, develop a certain sensitivity towards various contexts. And um, the argument it proposes that these contexts needs to be seen as materialist context. So there is a jugglery that contextualism is presented as materialism or the other way around, they are conflated. And this kind of a criticism uh, is looking at Benevitz as someone who was sensitive to the materialist context towards the cultural differences, so to say. So he was not someone uh, you can charge as being Eurocentric. Uh, he was definitely uh, committed to a certain socialist framework and he was interested in uh, using Brecht to, to <coughs> propagate certain ideas, political ideas, but he was not dogmatic. He was not a party person. Though he came through official intergovernmental channels, he was very open to uh, collaboration. And he was not imposing his cultural framework uh, upon India, but at the same time, he was very critical of a certain exoticism which uh, can result if uh, a European, uh, European here in a cultural sense, uh, encounters uh, an Asian or Indian situation uh, and tends to sort of valorize uh, the, the Orientalist in a manner, uh, we, we see uh, in the German thinking, there is a tradition of that valorization from Max Müller onwards, that you see uh, uh, Orient as this, uh, as this site of wisdom, of spirituality, and so on and so forth. So he's interested, according to this kind of an intercultural reading, uh, avoid both the traps of Eurocentricism and this kind of a, uh, Oriental exoticism. And yet he is materialist, yet he is Marxist uh, in his own way, but his, his Marxism is self-critical enough uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, while I was going through Benevitt's own writings, which are only recently available, two, three years ago, uh, his notes, his diaries are translated into English. And uh, while going through, you realize that actually uh, the way he is using the term culture uh, is, is very different than the intercultural framing 
Because in the intercultural framing, one presupposes that <coughs> culture is, is seen in an identitarian discourse. So culture is tied to a particular land, a group of people, and culture is seen as a predicate, as a property, and a presupposition of an identitarian discourse on culture that there are cultures. So culture is essentially a plurality, and there are several modalities in which this plurality needs to be negotiated, and the dominant modality uh, of our times has been the liberal modality to protect the plurality of cultures as plurality without resorting into a domination of one culture over the other. And I believe that a certain post-colonial critique of Eurocentricism actually operates within this paradigm, this paradigm of identitarian discourse on culture. It looks at culture as an authentic innate property of a land or a group of people. And it tries to in a way use culture as a resource of resistance while fighting with the other. So the culture is the site of that resistance as we know that which is generally termed as cultural nationalism where one brackets the inner domain from the outer domain and so on. So I did not go into the details of the post-colonial arguments here. But that is the modality. But interestingly, they both share the common framework of identitarian discourse on culture. And while reading Benevitz, I realized that actually he is not using the culture in identitarian sense at all. In fact, he is interested in culture as a resource of emancipation. And there I think one needs another discourse on culture, which is an emancipatory discourse, where culture is not necessarily a property, an innate, original, authentic property of tied to either of them, where in fact culture needs to be seen uh, as emerging through what we were discussing since yesterday through events. So events are ruptures, ruptures in a historical continuum where new names, new ideas, new ways of imagining collective coexistence emerge and one finds a cultural articulation of this newness which is anonymous and generic. So it may go by the name French, but it is not tied to a territory called France. So it is not geocultural or geopolitical or identitarian. So anyone who participates in that emancipatory project, share those principles and values, can lay a claim upon, lay a claim upon France. France as an idea, or Europe as an idea. Of course, we know that the emancipatory projects get appropriated, appropriated, get institutionalized, and get entangled uh, within the geopolitical modalities uh, of security, of territory, of population, and so on and so forth. And there is a contestation which begins. And uh, one of the important uh, <coughs> sites of that in 20th century is the way culture was thought about uh, around the time of October Revolution. And that's the time when Brest is uh, active. And uh, you see a, a range of responses to October Revolution, uh, which go by the name of uh, Prolet Cult Movement or October Group in Germany, where communism was not necessarily seen in a homogeneous, top-down fashion. It was seen as a release of energy, of reimagining the world, reconfiguring time and spaces, inventing new forms, new ways of living, and so on. And you have an entire spectrum of avant-garde modernist practices, which go under the name of expressionism, futurism, Dadaism, and so on and so forth, which one can broadly schematize as proletarian, Marxist, or communist, but in the broadest sense, not in a party sense. And during the interwar period, Brecht and Benjamin enter into a, a rigorous contestation with Lukács on the other end over the question of expressionism, or the relation between aesthetics and politics. 
So yes, there is a contestation between aesthetics and politics even within an emancipatory discourse of culture. It's not that it is free of that. But nonetheless, the difference between an identitarian and emancipatory discourse on culture and uh, which one finds a great deal in Benevitz's own writing is that culture is still seen as a tool, as a tool to further the emancipatory project. So culture is not an end in itself, it is not a property, it is not to be museumized or archived, it's not something uh, which is sacred in itself. So there is a complete disdain for this idea of culture as, pluri uh, as a purity, as immemorial, as ancient and so on and so forth. Or the, that distinction between uh, the elite and the popular or the folk and the classical, uh, there is a certain kind of indifference toward that kind of a bracketing. So you just make borrow steel from wherever you can and as long as uh, you can intervene into uh, the political uh, world, into the public realm as such and create new forms and create a historical consciousness out of the existing material which could be historical, mythological, in the realm of memory, you tap into whatever. It does not matter and I think there are four such elements which I find in Benevitz uh, which are quite interesting. On the one hand, uh, and in his notes, he's constantly thinking about that, that while reading the notes it may appear that he is just being orientalistic, uh, orientalist in saying that the Indians do not really have a historical consciousness. No, he's, he's not making that kind of a judgment in a high-handed sense. He's interested in how to activate that historical consciousness then and there while working with the actors. Or the, another interesting idea which is a classical Christian idea is how to find a certain unity of enlightenment and entertainment. Or uh, the idea which was quite uh, dear to Benevitz's own work that how do you practice didactic theatre across cultures or how to test social intention of the play. So whether the social intention of a play works across the culture or not it has to be tested. So in a sense Brecht encountering India is a test of Brecht also. So it's not that uh, it's just about translating Brecht as such or Indianizing Brecht or making him more authentic but it's also testing him, experimenting him. So there, and in his notes he's constantly uh, in a way re-looking Brecht and says, oh maybe we need to modify these things. We need to change these things. So Brecht is an ongoing constellation for Benedict, at least in the early part of his work. Of course something changes after 1973. So these are the notes I'm looking at from 1967 to 1973. Now I'll come to the second part of my paper where <coughs> I want to take off from this collaboration of Brecht and Benevitz to look at uh, something else uh, and that's where I would like to talk about the conjunctural framing as such. So this collaboration, Brecht and Benevitz collaboration, uh, found a very interesting set of responses in Maharashtra. Uh, and particularly uh, by a group of amateur theatre enthusiasts uh, who later formed Theatre Academy in 1972-1973 uh, and all of them were coming from very diverse backgrounds, pediatrics and biochemists and psychiatrists and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, Dr. Jabbar Patel, Dr. Mohan Agashi, Satish Aikar and so on. So, they in fact encounter Brecht in a very strange manner. So they encounter two Brechts. One was uh, directed by Karl Weber uh, and commissioned by the West Germany. So Karl Weber came to Delhi first in 1965 and he was doing a Caucasian truck circuit with Nasiruddin Shah who was uh, into a repertory that time, 66-67. And in order to complete Karl Weber's uh, entry, East Germany, which still did not have formal relations with India, the relations were established only uh, in 1972 with Indira Gandhi. So the trade relations were there. So as a part of furthering trade relations, they uh, sent Fritz Benevitz. And Benevitz was directing Three Penny Opera with Manohar And now both these productions were made to travel across India. 
uh, under the auspice of Max Müller Bauern. But again, Max Müller Bauern had a problem with East German version. So there was this uh, all German appropriation of Brest, Brest as a part of the German heritage, or Brest as socialist Brest. So that contestation, and uh, both these productions came to Pune. And all these theatre enthusiasts saw both the productions. Interestingly, they found the Benevitz's production as something which is something lacking there. Something which is uh, too mechanical. Something uh, which is a drill-like thing. It, it lacks a spontaneity. It's dull. But at the same time, you are reading Brecht. They were subscribing uh, TDR and they were studying theatre. But interestingly, they were not just reading Brecht. Of course, they were reading Stanislavski, but they were also uh, interested in Arto. They were also, int uh, the interest uh, in Grzowski was also increasing. So there was an eclectic milieu within which Brecht was one. And I think uh, Vijay Mehta, who collaborated with Benevitz, also comes from that. So interestingly, in Maharashtra, the experimental theatre always, uh, especially in the post-independence uh, period, the first two decades, was interested in a certain eclectic kind of a menu. And uh, the task they had undertaken is to educate people about these new trends in world theatre. So uh, they would perform, say, Inesco, and after that uh, they would conduct a lecture on theatre of the absent. And they would conduct a dialogue with the audiences. Uh, that was Vijay Mehta's Rangayan project. Similarly, so in a sense, it, there is a certain studious approach to these various uh, kinds of theatres coming. So obviously, uh, they could not really appreciate Brecht uh, in, in that uh, straight-jacketed socialist political sense, but they were interested in Brecht as such. So I pause the story here and go to the East German part. So like Benevitz came to India, at the same time there were many uh, theatre directors who were interested in uh, exploring the constellation opened up by Brecht, but in their own ways. And one of the important ones was, or the important one was Heiner Müller. Now Heiner Müller's uh, relation with Brecht is extremely complicated. On the one hand, Brecht is his master, but on the other hand, he wanted an un-Brechtian or anti-Brechtian Brecht. And uh, let's look at the distinction here. An important year needs to be marked here, 1953, where the workers' uprising in East Germany was suppressed by the party and Brecht maintained a certain silence over this. Müller's generation was very uncomfortable with this science. Because on the one hand, they knew that uh, Brecht was an iconic figure uh, in the struggle against fascism. But at the same time, that fascism is not defeated by the Stalinist forces or by the Soviet Union as claimed by the official narrative. In fact, the fascism has become an everyday reality and Brecht is not talking about that. So, in Müller's uh, appreciation of Brecht in the 50s, that there is a certain rational optimism in Brecht which needs to be questioned. So, in fact, they did not, uh, they also uh, had issues with Vijay Mehta. And uh, a lot of them in their interviews and writings have articulated this problem. So, they thought that uh, Vijay Mehta's preoccupation with a certain naturalism continues to lurk even when she does breast. In fact, she turns breast into a very decorative and a political kind of a playwright. And at the same time, they thought that uh, she is basically uh, utilizing the Sarkari connections, her proximity to the power. She was also initially close to al Qazi and uh, then later to New Delhi. So, they always thought that the Mehta Benevitz breast is a Sarkari breast official Brecht, New Delhi Brecht, NST Brecht. And this needs to be understood culturally that in Maharashtra there is a strong political reaction to New Delhi ever since Tilak. So New Delhi is seen as this kind of a tyrant or this kind of a centralized power which is highly insensitive to Maharashtra and the memories again came back during the Sanyukta Maharashtra moment where uh, Nehru and Muraji Desai both crushed uh, the uh, workers and peasants uh, resistances and the demand for Maharashtra. So all those memories accumulate. 
and uh, the response to, to Mehta is mediated through all of that. But at the same time, uh, they are actually interested very much in breast access and that I find very interesting but their negotiation with breast uh, uh, take a very different route. Anti-naturalist, anti-realist, anti-decorative and uh, trying to connect breast with their everyday living reality. So in a way to make their own breast, which could be unbreasted. Here uh, I will pause and look at a response of a very important Marathi critic called Pushpa Bhavi. So she saw the benefits Mehta collaboration and she says there is a great deal of celebration of that, everybody is talking about, everybody is reviewing that, but why only breast? Why only he is considered as radical? Why are we isolating breast from the constellation of Beckett and Arto and so on and so forth? Why are we singling him out? Because of his communist leanings? And here comes another point that there is a great kind of a communist phobia or anti-communism in Maharashtra. The dominant uh, progressive ideology in Maharashtra is a certain kind of a Gandhian socialism of that point. I mean, they have been uh, important communist groups and peasants and uh, workers parties and so on and so forth. But in western Maharashtra, in Pune and Mumbai, the dominant milieu is a certain Gandhian socialist. So communism is seen with a certain disdain and that disdain is actually informed by a certain nativism. That the communists are basically satellite intellectuals, they are not rooted. They do not really know the tradition that well. They are either looking to Beijing or to Moscow or so that kind of a thing and which runs across South Asia uh, in, in different regions. Pushpa Bhave also thought that this kind of a breast is very naive and imitative. And at the same time she makes a very interesting reference that while all of this is happening, Grotowski's assistant is in Mumbai, nobody talks about him. The assistant who had worked on Maratsa. Why is nobody talking about Marat Sat? And interestingly, if you look at this entire constellation, if you look at uh, cut and go to the other side, Mueller is actually interested in reading Brest along with Arthur, along with Beckett, along with Petrovice. So in a sense, this new operation on Brest, which is outside of this classical socialist or party state model, is a very important exploration which is going on uh, in uh, East Germany as well as in uh, the Maharashtrian context and which is what I call a conjuncture. So it's not that the cultural difference uh, which can help us understand these two responses, but actually these are heterogeneous responses but operating within a certain shared global conjuncture and I think that conjuncture needs to be understood as saturation of the didactic schema, which uh, Shomik was talking about earlier, that somewhere the relation between art and instruction, art and education needs to be rethought because the didactic schema in 20th century was primarily aligned to Marxism, to dialectical materialism and there is a great deal of skepticism about the, uh, uh, the official version of that dialectical materialism. So a new dialectical framing which uh, to use Adorno's term uh, goes by the name negative dialectics was uh, seen as, as a more critical and a more rigorous and a more materialist sort of a engagement with the world as opposed to the Lukas kind of a, uh, a framing of the earlier period. And the saturation of the didactic schema is aligned to the crisis of the party state model. And that's where I think 1968 becomes a very important juncture because it enunciates very clearly that we need to conceive or recommence a emancipatory project beyond capturing state power, beyond liberal democracy and representative politics. Election is a con, is one of the important sentences produced by 68. So this disillusionment with both the, the liberal representative democracy on the one hand and this authoritarian state socialism on the other hand, in fact they are seen as bedfellows and Mao is the one who uh, utters that. Uh, and uh, he is quite right there that this whole peaceful coexistence business which is going on between America and Russia is completely revisionist in nature. So revisionism is a very important term of reference for uh, identifying this crisis of party state model. 
And all of this is happening in, in different locations. So in China, in, in Japan, uh, the kind of communist movement which is emerging, which is uh, documented by Oshima and Mamura and others. Um, or in India, you have the Lakshalbari movement which is emerging around the same time. In France, you have 1968. In Germany, the 68 produces a very different reaction uh, altogether, which is unlike the West, but conjuncturally uh, belonging to that same epoch, that same period. And uh, there I think we need to understand what kind of a dynamic is happening here. Uh, I'll now come to the Theatre Academy uh, side uh, a bit. There are certain uh, contours uh, of this conjunctural engagement on the Theatre Academy side. Uh, and uh, I, I, by conjunctural framing, I do not want to sort of uh, uh, elevate them from uh, any kind of uh, uh, fallibility or I, it's not that I want to absorb them of any criticism. Uh, I would like to look at the problematics they were dealing with, certain questions they were raising to themselves and so on, but at the same time certain uh, reactions. So the first is the relation between theory and practice. So Theatre Academy began as a study circle and even now in, uh, in Maharashtra, theatre groups begin as study circles. So people come together, read, discuss, and through that they want to do theatre. That's not the case in cinema. Cinema, nobody comes to study anything. People want to make films. But in, in theatre, uh, that has never been the case. But that doesn't mean that there is an intellectualist atmosphere in Maharashtra. In fact, within these study circles, you always find tendencies which are apprehensive of the intellectualist kinds. So there is an apprehension towards theory and intellectual approach to art. And this anti-intellectualism I would like to sort of trace to a certain Brahmanism in Maharashtra. A Brahmanism uh, which lurks within the progressive socialist and uh, artistic uh, spaces. And this Brahmanism, uh, the, this anti, and I've uh, written about it previously while writing about on, on Tindulkar, particularly on Tindulkar, that this anti-intellectualism is primarily uh, against a certain uh, social theory. It's, it's not against uh, natural sciences. A lot of them are coming from natural sciences and uh, they think that that is science. And everything else needs to be dealt with a certain spontaneity, with a certain freshness, where you don't have to get lost into, say, this theoretical gibberish and so on and so forth. But at the same time, they feel the need to be serious enough to do something. So while talking to all of them, uh, Satish Alitra and Mohan Agarshi, all of them said, Jabbar Patel was like a terror who used to make us think, who would ask us to go and watch a film and play and write a note on it. And while watching the play, we used to be terrified, oh fuck, uh, what are we going to tell to Jabbar now? When we return, uh, he's going to ask, okay, why, uh, okay, you liked it? Why did you like it? Give me 10 reasons. Be articulate, read, write. And uh, they used to feel that, oh, this is actually killing our spontaneity. Um, and they were also seeing around them, I mean, a certain Brahminical image that uh, the intellectuals are indecisive, uh, they are dry, uh, they dissect the wholeness of experience all the time. So there is a certain romantic schema of art at play. And the tension between the didactic and romantic is uh, there in the relation between theory and practice. So on the one hand, uh, they would like to be didactic, but at the heart of their heart, they are romantic. And that's where lies the popularity of Mahesh and Kunjwar for many. Because he is someone who calls the shot and argues against G.P. Deshpande and others saying that, no, no, it is the romantic access to the art which is purer, which is elevating, which is ennobling, and so on and so forth. And so there is a certain fascination for that kind of a mysticism. Another response is that test of art is in doing so like Brecht, so they would coin, uh, quote Brecht now and then, uh, like Brecht says that uh, the test of the pudding is in eating, so basically it's about doing. So why are we so uh, spending so much of time in studying Brecht? Whereas the group members coming from German study would say that no, but you will have to study. That's where comes a very interesting moment where they decide to do Brecht directly. And uh, that is their adaptation of Tripeni Opera, which is written uh, or Rupanta, so to say, which is kind of a Marathi adaptation by the great uh, Marathi humorist P. L. Deshpande. And he turns it into a Teen Paishata Tamasha. So he uses a Tamasha form, sets it in Mumbai, in slums, underworld, so on and so forth. Musical. And musical uh, where different musical forms are brought in. 
uh, both Western as well as uh, Indian, and a certain fusion, a certain cacophony, a, a fairly creative blending uh, done by Bhaskar Chandavarkar and Anand Modak. But interestingly, uh, I was talking to many uh, who were part of this uh, play, they never read uh, Three Penny Opera. None of them were even aware of the original text or what kind of a departures from there. So there was no discussion of breast at such. There was only a discussion of how to make it work, how to do it in a certain spontaneous sort of a fashion. In fact, this adaptation ran into a controversy because P.L. Deshpande thought that he is actually adapting it. But uh, Brest's daughter, who was now the guardian of Brest in East Germany, took an objection. She launched a court case on this, saying, and this controversy actually came to the forefront in Benoit, in the Brest Festival, uh, in late 70s, I think in 78 it was. Uh, so uh, the play was performed, and um, the Bengali audiences who are very much interested in several adaptations of Brest in Bengal, uh, they started asking, so, okay, what is your take? What is your interpretation of Brest here? Why certain things are done certain way? To which everybody said, but first tell me you liked the play or not. Did you enjoy it or not? I mean, why are you hair-spitting? So this response, and uh, that's where I think there was a certain uh, kind of a reaction to Bengali uh, uh, intellectualism in, in, in Maharashtra theatre, uh, which came to the forefront at that point. So, but nonetheless, everyone, uh, while talking about Tipa uh, Tamasha, refers to a very powerful performance uh, by an extremely talented uh, actress, but who uh, worked very little, called Madhuri Purandari. Uh, she, she was also one of the lead uh, performers in the uh, Mangra of the film, I did of El Kunchwar. While I was talking to her, she said, uh, see, I was not coming from a very intellectual background. She was a painter, studied in Cheji. But then she went to France in the immediate aftermath of 68. So she had a first-hand experience of the unfolding of an intense revolutionary sequence. And that opened up her sensitivity towards Brecht. And that's where a very interesting kind of a, um, a, a response is emerging that we need not necessarily polarize this between either be studious or be spontaneous, but you can maintain both by remaining a certain close, real relationship with the things happening around you, which is to say that you will have to critically look at your own class position, your caste position, your gender, and so on and so forth. Uh, so forth. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the next uh, uh, tendency you find, uh, and uh, particularly in uh, uh, Satish Ayakar, is to uncouple Brestian techniques from the ideology or the politics of the Brest. And while uh, in, in interview he constantly mentions that, see, I, I'm not bothered about Brest per se. I mean, I, I find the same repertoire of techniques uh, uh, in Indian traditions, in Tamasha and so on and so forth. And I don't want to get into the culturalist debate, but his whole point is that I don't necessarily uh, need to be socialist or to be left, to be Brexit. I mean, I can produce those effects from my own life experience, from my milieu, from my surrounding, which could be Brahminical. But uh, nonetheless, I will decompose that surrounding uh, with a certain usage of language, of dark humor, and uh, using certain forms and subverting them from within, like he does with Sangeet Natak in uh, Bikram Bharti. So this kind of a possibility of subversion without necessarily being officially Brestian is another tendency here. The next one uh, is uh, a response of G.P. Deshpande, which I find uh, very interesting and ambiguous. Uh, they, he was not a part of theatre academy, he was in New Delhi, but he was a uh, close observer of theatre here and also writing his plays were being produced. Now his response is actually, uh, uh, on the one hand, when he's looking at the Indian breast, the kind of authentic, exoticized breast, he says, oh, we need anti-breast. But, uh, and this came up in some interviews uh, that he never publicly wrote, but he actually disliked breast as such even uh, the classical Brecht also. So, uh, and uh, he was of the opinion that, see, uh, and he, he could never really vocalize it because he was too close to party, but he was also not a party member. Uh, and there's an interesting story that when he wrote, uh, it was the Dharmasha, uh, P.T. Randive came to see the play and Randive persuaded him to join the party. He said, we need a, a cultural uh, icon like you that you will be uh, really the Marxist playwright. He says, no, no, I, I am Marxist, but I don't want to be a party member, as such. 
and he maintained that kind of a uh, uh, distant relation with party throughout, but obviously he could not really vocally take a stance again, uh, against Brest as such. But nonetheless, uh, his whole problem with Brest was, uh, and he articulated that uh, in his writings, that see, for Indian Marxists, the most important question is to analyze the defeat of transformative project. So it's primarily coming from a certain melancholic position. So it's a story of defeat, as he says, dialectics of defeat. Whereas he says, I find in Brest too much of rational optimism. There is no introspection of why this project goes wrong. Why uh, it fails to really become popular. Why it gets hijacked by the state and the party model. Uh, why there is so much of fragmentation in progressive politics. Why this fragmentation does not really produce new synthesis. So why there is this blockage of dialectics? And interestingly, we see a similar kind of an introspection in Mueller, but from a very different end. So, which is why he thinks that uh, Brest is someone totally useless for me. And at the same time, he is seeing that Brest is being hijacked and appropriated for very decorative and exotic purposes by fusing Brest uh, with certain folk and authentic uh, sort of idioms. So that being one. Now I will now come to the very last point, and which is a small anecdote, a kind, but a very ironic anecdote. The Theatre Academy um, toured uh, Europe for the first time in the late 70s and uh, performed their iconic Garchiram Kotwal in West Germany. Uh, and they did their final performance of Garchiram Kotwal in Berliner Ensemble in East Germany two weeks before the fall of Berlin Wall. So there is a gap of almost a decade between these two productions. And interestingly, this decade is also the rise and fall of Theatre Academy as such. Because uh, after doing its first international production, uh, Theatre Academy became closely aligned with Max Müller Bowen. And uh, that's where I started my story. So Max Müller Bowen was trying to uh, enter into uh, collaborative uh, exercises with Theatre Academy. Theatre Academy was open to taking money and grants and so on. Uh, and uh, Max Müller Bowen wanted them to do breast, but Mohanagashi says at that point we'll do anything else but breast. That's where they said, okay, we'll offer you several new scripts. And Günther Grass's uh, deluge uh, is given to Satish Ayakar. And he translates it into Marathi and he directs it himself. Then comes a very interesting moment where um, Volker Ludwig meets uh, Mohanagashi. And they enter into a collaboration which results into grips. In all of this, what is happening is that the anti-intellectualist stance, which was latent or kind of at the margins of Theatre Academy in its making in late 60s, 70s, come to the fore. And it becomes like a commercial endeavour. It becomes like an icon. So in one of the stories, uh, Monagashi was telling me, I mean, uh, without the irony, he was in fact celebrating. He says, whenever the foreigners used to come to Pune, uh, for various reasons, uh, to go to archives or study for uh, Indology. Uh, it was mandatory for them to visit uh, Shaniwarwada, Saras Bagh and watch Gashiram Kotwal. So Gashiram Kotwal was this iconic kind of a monumental thing and it completely got fossilized and so on and so forth. And then when they were traveling uh, to, and obviously could not have been anticipated that this is going to happen, the, the entire crumble of uh, the Soviet Union, and this tour is now mediated by the intergovernmental channels. So unlike their all earlier foreign tours, which were primarily private tours, because they were tapping into Maharashtra Mandals in uh, France, in London, in America, and traveling on their own. And they constantly kept on uh, telling that we are not like Vijaya Mehta, we enter into this governmental kind of a stuff and we take money from the state and then go and do decorative stuff which is exotic and sell Indian culture. We are not like that. But just when uh, uh, the Gashram Kotwal was traveling to East Germany and Soviet Union, it happened through the intergovernmental channel. And obviously because, uh, and that is the interesting thing, that you could not have gone to the eastern side of the Cold War spectrum without intergovernmental channel. You could have gone to West on your own, you can make your own contacts and do. But the kind of passports you require to move across the east, where you're going from, uh, say, Moscow to Belgrade to, uh, to Berlin and so on and so forth. So, uh, and uh, I did extensive interviews with all of them and the kind of experiences they share of this travel tells you that 
almost all of them were completely taken aback by what was happening. Very few exceptions who were uh, keenly observing the political developments in Europe and were sharply attuned to it, barring a couple of exceptions, almost everybody was completely shocked. How do you respond to this? How, I mean, what kind of position do you take? Do you celebrate that the wall is falling and this kind of a triumph? Or do you mourn that, oh, this entire socialist project is crumbling? And that's when you realize that the kind of a Brahminical progressive middle class core which formed Theatre Academy was at at the heart of it, uh, earlier we named it as romantic, but on the other hand, a certain fascistic tendencies were coming to the surface of it. And within a span of one year, those fascistic tendencies took over of the group itself. So, and now, uh, after 25, 30 years, you see that those tendencies have completely hijacked Theatre Academy. And uh, Satisha Ekar, Dr. Mohan Agarshe, Dr. Jabbar Patel, everyone is thrown out of the group, and the group is completely taken over by someone who is close to Raj Thakre, who is close to Shiv Sena, who is close to a certain kind of a right wing assertion by Marathas as well as Brahmin. So, it's that precarious moment of disintegration of Theatre Academy and dissolution of the Soviet bloc is, is kind of an ironic uh, thing which I would like to end this talk. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kandis, for the presentation. The floor is now open for questions. So, uh, let me just uh, uh, ask you a very uh, since Brecht in the kind of orthodox Brechtian teaching distinguishes between and makes also a kind of hierarchy uh, between didactic and epic, where epic is a more public space of performance and didactic is something which is the teaching for the actors, of the, for the group, something which is, well, introspective in that sense. Uh, maybe not introspective in the sense that you are talking about and GPD, uh, which is introspection about the crisis or the, or the failures, but introspection in the sense of something which is strategic, tactical, how, how to develop this sort of a rational consciousness. Even the rational consciousness has to be, has to be produced. Yeah. Um, so, which is of course also part of the larger um, the larger organization of Marx, even if it's not party, but there is a kind of inherent organization of Marxist thought also, yeah. which has this didactic to this epic, and eventually put together a kind of dialectical, what you call dialectical theater. Hmm. Uh, so, no, I'm just curious that all of this systematization uh, in the Marathi experience, do you either see it happening at any level, given that you're also saying that they're not really connected to the communist movement and there is no unified communist movement in Maharashtra. Yeah. Nevertheless, in the theater groups, uh, is there some consciousness of Brecht in, in a kind of point-to-point -point separated and then unified as a system? Brecht as a system of thought, anything like that? Uh, uh, not really, not really. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the distinction you spoke uh, between the didactic and epic uh, is, is not taken in that same stride. Uh, the dialectical tension between these two forms. In fact, there is a conflation of these two ideas and uh, the general uh, misunderstanding, so to say, is that the epic is didactic okay. or the epic needs to work as didactic, as instructive and then the problem begins that, oh, but then you're taking away uh, all the juice, uh, you're basically making it dry, you're making it uh, to uh, drill-like. So, and. And that is bound to happen because uh, the didactic in Brest is basically the learning place. Right. Yeah. And Müller takes up upon that and turns it into a pedagogic theatre of participation, of democratic participation. Now, I, I don't think a theatre academy ever uh, in their formal official performances does that. Of course, there were certain small groups within theatre academy who were doing that, but they were uh, closed exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, they were never put out on stage or went for a tour or got that recognition. Uh, uh, like a, a, a Mahanirvan or Begum Barwe or a Kashram Kotwal. So I think there is a certain misreading of Brecht there, definitely. Uh, and because of, and uh, GPD used to call it that there is a disdain for Potiwat. So, uh, 
I, I think breast is seen more as a certain uh, set of uh, ready-made ideas, certain intro, uh, uh, beginner's guide to breast kind of a consciousness you would find, mm -hmm. not a more uh, 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 granulated and subtle and sharp sort of perception. Well, in Bengal, uh, the other thing happened, some didactic plays became such successful public performances, they, they nearly became commercial plays. <laughs> yeah. uh, for instance, Exception of the Rule uh, was one uh, terrific success with the Bengali audience. Nandikar produced it and it was a commercial hit. But it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most important didactic plays, learning plays written by Brecht. Uh, so, yeah, even that. Uh, In fact, to, to, to respond to that, uh, there are two points which uh, I would uh, like to say. Uh, so, when uh, Arikar saw Muller's Hamlet machine for the first time in 1983, uh, when he went for the international ITI conference uh, in Berlin, he said, that's where for the first time I saw breast, or what breast can be. Uh, and a similar experience is encountered by others as well. The second point, which is uh, uh, a separate one but nonetheless adds to it, is that uh, a lot of them uh, in the interview said that by mid-80s, we were started doubting the fact that uh, there could be any instruction uh, art at all is possible of instruction or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because uh, a small group from Theatre Academy uh, started doing uh, what we would call a situationist theatre which went by the name of Patanatya or folk theatre or street plays and such but uh, the way they were imagining that so several situations they were telling that they created an anti-Vietnam war situation outside of Shariwar Bada right, right. or uh, there was a, a kind of a burning of a, 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 a woman in a society so they staged a burning within that society and they completely sort of glorified it, romanticized it to an extent that it started becoming completely obnoxious right. So, to, so they were trying that out for four or five years and uh, it went under the name of uh, Sankalp and Prayas. But by 83 or 84, they uh, started self-doubting and they said, see, we are impressed uh, by an art which is a great art and which is not trying to teach anything as such. So maybe we need to refocus our energies on producing great art rather than a sort of uh, trying to force a certain instruction or a message and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, uh, during the Ratha Yatra uh, uh, in 87-88, the last performance of this small group, what they did is that uh, they tried to sort of instigate a riot uh, in, uh, on Ferguson College Road near Cafe Gudluck. A simulation of a certain riot-like situation and that's when they realized that it's actually not reaching at all. So maybe it's, uh, on the other hand, as you said, in uh, Bengal that it became commercial success. Yeah. Here, uh, it, it's a certain disillusionment uh, with those tactics. Any more questions? Comments? I, I, in fact, would like to ask a, <laughs> a curious question to, uh, to show me over here. That, uh, what was it like in, in Delhi? Because you were reading Brecht and Muller and Ortho and Beckett around the same time. What was your relationship to, to them? I mean, how did you read well, them? Well, I was reading these things from early 80s. Oh. Yeah. Uh, 70s was not when I was in any way uh, part of any kind of too young to be part of any kind of proper you know, uh, cultural or theatre movement. So it was from early 80s that I was uh, reading or, or consciously interested in these things. But I would say, in De and I was in Delhi only from the 80s, um, early 80s. Um, but I would say something yeah, very interesting I saw in that period as a spectator uh, was um, Brecht being performed um, in the uh, uh, these festivals. Uh, uh, this was, of course, much before the Mah Maharanga and the Bharat, uh, this NSD festival started, but there were several festivals. So one festival I remember at that time was being organized by the government uh, at the Pragati Madan. Pragati Madan had a very nice theater called uh, Manzar. It was one of the best theaters in uh, Delhi had, but it was, uh, it, 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 it was operational only for maybe three or four years, and the, God knows why they closed it down. 
So there used to be an annual festival in which I saw a lot of Brecht done in Hindi, which was not actually produced by Delhi, Delhi uh, groups, uh, not NSD, not any Delhi group, but by Bharat, uh, Bharat Bhavan, the um, uh, Rangmandal Bharat Bhavan, Bhopal. Bhopal. Yeah, Bhopal. And the main director, of course, was Karant. This was before Karant became the director of NSD. Uh, so that was, for me, a very different kind of an experience because I had only uh, read about Brecht in Bengal, Bengali adaptations, and I, I knew a little bit about that uh, in those days. But the, the, um, the experience of watching Caucasian Chop Circle, Good Woman of Shazna, but particularly I remember Caucasian Chop Circle, because it also featured uh, that fantastic actress who has passed away, unfortunately, Vibha Mishra. Uh, she was performing Grusha, and of course the strength of the play was its music. Um, so Grusha's performance as a virtuoso performance, and the amazing music, which was deeply rooted in a kind of folk music of which Karant was a master. Uh, now all of that amounting to what kind of Brechtian principles about that? I mean, it's uh, it's. You know, too long back for me to really um, to remember and discuss at, with any kind of accuracy. But I do remember being quite impressed by the sheer what you are talking about the the adaptation at the level of the idiom itself. You know, uh, uh, which was which was very different from the urban breath that I had seen or heard about in the Bengali context. So something very rooted at that level, and it impressed me a lot um, at that time. But surely, politically, it was not in any way Brechtian. That was very clear. Uh, so this was something I saw at that time when I was reading Brecht, but also you know, I saw Brecht in the early 80s. But that was also a very short-lived um, Brechtian fa or, you know, phase of seeing Brecht productions. Uh, because Bhar uh, the, Maha the Rangmandal plays happened in that period, and then Karanth came here, and lots of problems happened. You know all that story. Uh, so it was short-lived. After that, in Delhi, Brecht was done just as, like you said, as part of the canon of many European master playwrights who you were adapting in a very institutional, really had no impact, really meant very little. Maybe certain performances were good, certain directors. So yes, Benevitz. But the interesting thing is Benevitz's Brecht productions, Benevitz's Shakespeare productions, Benevitz's other productions were all part of Benevitz's work in India, including his you know, the plays that I saw uh, being performed by other groups. So I have actually seen Benevitz, not Brecht, but Benevitz's Shakespeare. But of course, his way of doing Shakespeare was different from, say, how Habib Tanvi did Shakespeare. The same play, Midsummer Night's Dream, but done very differently. So Karanth, Benevitz, Habib Tanvi, I would say these were three great directors at that time, in the 80s, who I saw, I mean, their production. Uh, but that's the interesting thing. Karan's doing Brecht, but not Brechtian in any <laughs> systematic. While uh, Benevitz doing Shakespeare, but in a specifically Brechtian kind of an idiom. And Habib Tanvir, a political director, but actually doing something which is quite uniquely his own style. So that was the kind of landscape. But theoretically, Benevitz is, I mean, Anuradha talks about it a lot. Benevitz did sort of, imp, uh, sort of engrave a kind of, a kind of motto which is the motto historicize. Histo so whether he considered Indians to lack historical consciousness or not, I mean, that is something we can talk about. Or I mean, maybe we shouldn't talk about it, it means very little. He did, uh, he did, and to that extent, I would say, yes, uh, it was instructional. It was didactic. To the actors in Delhi, NSD or whoever he was working with, he would have this motto, this formula, which he would keep sort of hammering at the actors. Do not take anything for granted. Do not take anything as given to you by nature. Historicize. Historicize. That very, very core Brechtian teaching he did, he did bring to, you know, the actors. This much I have been told. Yeah. yeah so. And uh, just to add to that, uh, Vijayadeta in her autobiography, when uh, looking back at her collaboration, she said, in fact, I was interested in collaboration in the first place because I had done Good Woman of Sichuan on my own. Uh, but when I uh, saw Benevitz, I thought maybe I'll be able to learn uh, Brecht from the master. 
And while collaborating, I realized that he's too pedantic. In fact, he's not letting the actors be. He's stopping them in the rehearsals all the time. He's not letting them improvise and so on and so forth. In fact, one of the lead roles uh, was going to be performed by Dadur Indurikan, who was uh, the star of Tamasha Theatre uh, at that point, and he was going to play the lead in uh, uh, Ajab Nayavar to us, uh, the judge mm -hmm. character. But Tatu Indirikar was not at all used to the fact that uh, he will be given lines and he will be speaking the same lines every time. And he was thrown out of the play in the middle and uh, Suhas Bhalera was brought in and everyone was very disturbed by the fact. And so actually uh, in Maharashtra there is a strange reaction to benefits from Vijay Mehta only who is collaborating. That oh this is too pedantic. But I think there is also a result of uh, theatre no, culture no, 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 no. in different societies. no? Yes, yes, it is, it is. The very Absolutely. culture of rehearsals, production are very different. Probably whatever else Benevitz was coming with, he wouldn't want to impose any kind of European sure. example. But he would have a discipline. Absolutely. He would have a different discipline. Yeah. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. No, of course not. But course there are very different cultures of, of producing. So probably there was a clash of this. So one example that I can think of is uh, his uh, Benevitz's production of Galileo in Bengal which of course featured the greatest actor of the country at that time and any time actually, uh, Shambhu Mitra. Yeah, he was playing Galileo. Now, uh, Rustam Bharucha, my colleague, he has, because he was present at, uh, at those rehearsals, he tells us that it was a very peculiar kind of a situation. On the one hand, Benevitz did acknowledge that he has hardly met a better actor. But, because Shambhu Mitra was Shambhu Mitra and came with his own very strange and problematic ideas and of course he had absolute, uh, he was conscious of his, of his stature. He was also extremely neurotic yeah, through the rehearsal. So uh, Benavid said and uh, Rustam kind of confirms this that in rehearsals, at the very beginning of the rehearsals, Shambhu Mitra was performing at a level which was extraordinary. He had already reached some extraordinary level as Galileo. But then what happened was, as the rehearsals progressed, his performance started falling. Because of the fact that as a great actor, he, was, he became anxious about his position vis-a-vis -vis other actors. He, was, he kept complaining to Benavitz that I am not, I am being, I am being challenged, I am being, I am not being protected by the other actors. Yeah, there is something wrong going on here. And he became neurotic. And Benavitz has a difficulty because Shambhu Mitra was Shambhu Mitra and you realize the genius of the actor, but but you to deal with this strange kind of pathology. And as a result, the quality of the performance started falling. You know? Uh, so probably this is a mix of three things, the different cultures, yes. and then the position of the great actor in this overall question of uh, discipline. Of you know, could be seen negatively as drill, or could be seen as positively as something you know, which is which is part of a, a kind of a kind of science, like Brecht would say, a science. But in between, you have this the figure of the of this this act. Yes. So something. Some of that, and in fact, I agree because uh, when uh, in the interviews, many uh, would say that uh, that they uh, they would be fascinated by Uppal Dutt's production, but uh, apart from him, nobody else really could match up the scale of the performance. So whenever he's not on the stage, the entire production sort of would, well, uh, sort of go yeah, down. That is another kind of that's a story of Uppal Dutt because yes. his his plays are different. Yeah. I mean, he has a different repertoire. So one interesting thing with Uppal Dutt is that he is one original play. Uh, playwright and thinker and actor who does not do Brecht, who theoretically yeah. uh, actually debates the question of the appropriateness of Brecht. He right. doesn't say like GPD does that he doesn't like Brecht, but he says he's not the appropriate playwright for us. Right. Like GPD would say uh, in his own way uh, yeah. that, that it's not he's not the appropriate playwright, playwright. for us. So Utpal has consistently um, kept a distance from actual doing, though he translated Brecht. He, he translated Mother Courage. He did his uh, sort of scholarly, theoretical work and uh, literary work vis-a-vis -vis Brecht. That he was, uh, he and Shekhar Bandhapadzai, they were all part of that uh, very close to German culture at that time. They were, they were all ge Germanists at some level. They all knew German. Uh, but he never did Brecht. And very consciously. Because again, it, with Utpal it's a question of his, uh, his understanding of theatre and politics. 
So, in fact, if there is someone who can contend, as not just as theoretically, but as a, as a theatre practitioner, as an artist, but politically in this whole landscape, it's Uthalda, with the Brechtian, um, a, kind of, a kind of orthodox dominance of Brecht as the paradigm of political theatre. If someone contends with that, that's Uthalda. Yeah. First, right, one. Uh, no, by the way, I have, uh, I have something uh, like a question comment type vis-a-vis -vis the methodology that you have talked about this conjunctural methodology that yes. fascinating thing uh, to think about it that how you have brought together something which this kind of a cultural studies approach to theater and theater studies cultural studies collusion would not never allow you to do yes. in that sense so in that context i would want to ask you that this proposition that you are extracting from certain philosophical traditions in the, this kind of a didactic synthetic uh, sorry a kind of a synthesis a synthetic schema of didactic romanticism say in in the context of Maharashtra yeah. where a kind of uh, orthodox political use of art and a kind of an existential encounter with art um, synthesizes together uh, to propose uh, to produce a certain um, configuration and to, uh, which in, interestingly uh, gives us a way of, under, of, of questioning whether this can be actually compared to uh, what uh, but actually talks about vis-a-vis -vis the Western uh, modernity context, the context of Avogad, where the same kind of a synthetic schema arises out of a certain uh, uh, use of art, but at the same time uh, moving away from the earlier uh, representative understanding of art in, in, in our world. So that gives us a kind of a universalist point of view of understanding these two domains. Yes. But I was just uh, wondering uh, how you uh, respond to this, that, that you are also saying that there is a certain saturation of this schema in the Maharashtra uh, theatre scenario. So, uh, the, and so how would you uh, understand this saturation in the Maharashtra scenario from this perspective of the fact that it's there because in, in the kind of uh, uh, methodological concepts that you are mobilizing that as a response to this saturation you have something like a new paradigm from which you can think uh, artistic configurations, a kind of an exceptional paradigm from which you can think uh, the artistic uh, conceptualizations. Is that possible in the Maharashtra scenario that you are looking? That, and is it somewhere connected to what you are calling the, the kind of a fictitious uh, encounter between Heiner Müller and the Dalit Panther? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, you're, you're, you're very right. I think uh, the, <coughs> on the one hand, uh, if at all you were to use that word modernism, Certain modernist uh, tendencies are fused in Maharashtra with a certain Brahminical traits. And that constantly produces this false binary of socio-political on the one hand and art for art's sake or a certain romantic conception on the other hand. A certain powerful intense coming together of these two would require, and which is why I was talking about a counterfactual scenario where Müller and Dasal comes together, is a certain Dalit modernism. That was there in poetry and a certain Dalit modernist sequence uh, is not only limited to those who are uh, Dalit by birth, that would be too obscene to say. So uh, from Namdev Dasar to Arun Kolatkar you have that constellation and which still continues to go. Interestingly you do not have that in fiction and Aniket Zauri has consistently written about that because autobiography took over. So in prose writing autobiography became the dominant paradigm of Dalit uh, expression, so to say. In theatre, you have something called as Dalit Rangabhumi in a sense, but it always maintained a certain distance from modernist experimentation which was going on. So it followed a certain social realist idiom. So it's, it's kind of a counterfactual uh, uh, scenario where if at all that could happen. And uh, it's still not in sight in a sense because uh, you have a Dalit popular cinema in Maharashtra in the last 7 eight years or so. Uh, and unlike the uh, earlier moments where uh, a more progressive uh, kind of a stance on caste is completely challenged by a more confident Dalit assertion. But in theatre I still do not see uh, that happening. So I think it, it's kind of an open question that how uh, and where, where, uh, where that could happen.
So thank you again, and uh, we will start the next presentation shortly.